The Subcommittee on Research and Science Education will come to order. Good morning. Uh, we were almost a little bit tardy, but I see it's 10 o'clock. Uh, we were having uh, fun chatting with the witnesses, but we do have work to do. Uh, welcome to today's hearing entitled STEM in Action, Transferring Knowledge from the Workplace to the Classroom. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine approaches and programs that encourage and assist STEM professionals looking to transition their knowledge and skills from industry to a second career in teaching or to give back to classroom education as a mentor. Uh, I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. In today's hearing, we will discuss how career professionals in science, technology, engineering, and math are taking their knowledge, skills, and talents to the classroom as both teachers and mentors to help inspire and educate our next generation of scientists, engineers, and mathematicians. This hearing is the fourth in a series of STEM in Action hearings that the Science, Space, and Technology Committee has held during the 112th Congress and the first for the Research and Science Education Subcommittee. There are a variety of existing programs, both public and private, that focus on encouraging and preparing K-12 students for STEM degrees and careers and helping new and experienced teachers better teach STEM subjects. Today's hearing focuses on public and private endeavors that help STEM career professionals who have no traditional training or teaching in their backgrounds transition their industry experience, knowledge, and skills to the classroom. The transition for these STEM career professionals often entails a complete career switch or mentoring students and or teachers. The ability to educate and inspire is a quality that all teachers should possess. Individuals who have spent time in a STEM profession bring a unique perspective to the classroom and can make a great contribution to our STEM education efforts. At the same time, industry experience, knowledge, and skills alone do not necessarily make a good teacher. Good teaching requires an additional and special set of knowledge and skills. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about issues and challenges relating to the transition from successful STEM career professional to successful STEM teacher and about how STEM career professionals help teach and inspire our nation's children, the backbone and future of our economic and competitive success. And on a personal note, I would add that my wife, Martha, took the same path. Uh, she was a certified public accountant. We had kids, she retired from the profession, she went back to uh, UAH, University of Alabama in Huntsville, uh, obtained a math degree, and I'm going to boast on her for a second because she was the math student of the year, and then taught uh, mathematics, uh, having been a, a professional uh, previously. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, recognize Mr. Lipinski for his opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chairman Brooks, for uh, holding this hearing. and. Uh, we uh, both uh, share the uh, the fact that our, that our wives are uh, apparently very uh, smart mathematicians, so uh, that's uh, it's always very helpful. Um, and we both share a strong interest in improving STEM education in, in our country. You know how important it is for uh, the future of our country. Uh, today. Only one-third of the undergraduate degrees earned by American students are in a STEM field, compared with 63% in Japan and 53% in China. In a world where nearly everything we do is built on math, science, and technology, these numbers should concern us for America's future. Students with these skill sets are not only needed to change our world with the next vaccine, energy source, or communication system, but also to help drive a thriving American economy that produces good paying jobs here at home. And STEM jobs do pay well. According to a Wall Street Journal survey, majors in engineering, computer science, and accounting outpace their peers in marketing, psychology, or communications by ten dollars to $20,000 a year in their first job out of college. I know that many of our country's leading companies are deeply aware of our workforce challenges. We're going to hear from IBM and Abbott today about some of their initiatives to improve STEM education in this country. And many others, especially defense sector companies like Boeing and Honeywell, have similar programs. I'm especially looking forward to hearing from Dr. Jones about how the Abbott Education and Outreach programs in both Chicago and at her facility in California are enabling their scientists and engineers to work directly with students, teachers, and parents. Underlying many of these initiatives, as well as a number of federal programs, is the idea that it is easiest to attract students to STEM careers 
when they are inspired by the best and brightest teachers, mentors, and professionals. This is especially true at the K through 12 level, where researchers can play a unique role in improving STEM education by volunteering, serving as mentors to students, and by becoming STEM teachers themselves. We know that the success of students is highly dependent on the quality and effectiveness of their teachers. In fact, the number one recommendation of the National Academy's Rising Above the Gathering Storm report was to train more highly qualified STEM teachers and to enhance the content knowledge of current ones. Professional scientists and engineers already possess strong content knowledge, so they have great potential to be great STEM teachers if given the opportunity to develop the skills needed in the classroom. I'm interested in hearing about some of the challenges associated with this transition. One teacher training program that I'm particularly, particularly proud of is the Robert Noyce Teacher Scholarship Program at the National Science Foundation. In 2007, in the America Competes Act, I helped then-Chairman Gordon improve this program by adding NSF teaching fellowships for STEM professionals who want to complete their master's in education, get certified, and transition into a career in teaching. I look forward to hearing more from Dr. Beath about the teacher preparation program he is running at the University of Wisconsin with NOICE funding from the NSF. While I do not have any of the federal agencies represented on the panel today, I want to take this opportunity to highlight the important role of the federal STEM workforce in inspiring the next generation to pursue careers in the STEM fields. Historically, NASA has been the most visible example, helping to create an entire generation of scientists and engineers. We hear testimony from such individuals all the time, and I'm sure that Chairman Brooks has many of them in his own district. I find that today's students are equally inspired and energized by scientific and technical, technological challenges we face in the energy, environment, and other fields today. There's great value in connecting talented federal scientists and engineers from the Department of Energy, NOAA, and other mission agencies with STEM students who have a passion for these issues. Today's hearing provides us with an opportunity to hear more about how STEM professionals with expertise and valuable real life experiences are helping students better understand STEM concepts and learn about career opportunities. This is vital, not just for the companies involved, but for the future competitiveness of our nation. I wanna thank the witnesses for being here this morning and I look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I would like to introduce our witnesses, uh, our panel for today's hearing. Dr. Michael Beeth is a professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Wisconsin in Oshkosh. He has coordinated the Alternative Careers and Training Program, also known as ACT, since its exception in 2006. Mrs. Christine Sutton is a certified Alabama math, science, and technology initiative teacher, also known as AMSTI. She is very innovative and a creative instructor, employing hands-on activities in real-life situations to teach math. She fully embraces the use of technology such as computers, Elmo document cameras, and active boards as diverse methods of teaching. Being from my home district, and by the way, where my kids graduated from high school, I am proud to have her with us today. Ms. Robin Wilner is Vice President of Global Community Initiatives for the IBM Corporation. She oversees a range of global philanthropic and volunteer programs, including the Talent Programs Corporate Services Corporations, or CORPS, Transition to Teaching and Online Mentoring. Mr. Jason Morella is President of the Robotics Education and Competition Foundation, known as REC. Mr. Morella is responsible for the overall strategic planning, organization, development, program operations, and financial management of the nonprofit organization. Mr. Morella has more than 15 years of experience in the nonprofit, corporate, and academic sectors. Dr. Jennifer Jones is a principal clinical scientist at Abbott Vascular. At Abbott Vascular, Dr. Jones is responsible for phase three clinical trial development in the area of coronary devices and percussionist, correct me if I uh, mispronounce that, coronary intervention. Dr. Jones also works closely with the Abbott Family Science Program in California. 
Uh, as our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. I now recognize our first witness, Dr. Michael Beeth, for five minutes. Um, good morning. Chairman Brooks, Ranking Member Lipinski, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the ACT program with you today. My name is Michael Beeth, and I have coordinated the ACT program since 2006. ACT provides STEM professionals with five or four more years of work experience a path to transition into careers as teachers of math or science. The ACT program is unique in that we recognize and award credit for the academic preparation and real life experiences STEM professionals can bring to teaching. More than 100 STEM professionals have enrolled in the ACT program since 2006, and we've received inquiries about this program from another 300 individuals. The ACT program addresses and doc the documented need for highly qualified math and science teachers in Wisconsin. Northeast Wisconsin is fortunate to have the types of businesses and industries that can provide a large pool of individuals with degrees in math or science for the ACT program. 78% of our students come from within a 60 mile radius of Oshkosh, although we do have students in nearly every region of Wisconsin, as indicated on the map attached to my testimony. The impetus for the ACT program came through the Northeast Wisconsin Educational Resource Alliance, we call New Era, a consortium of K-12 school districts, public and private colleges, and universities across 18 Northeast Wisconsin counties. Part of New Era's mission encourages partnerships like ACT that serve the learning needs of the 1.2 million people in Northeast Wisconsin and that strengthen the business and industrial community as well. New Era is an outgrowth of New North, an organization of private and public sector business and education leaders that promote the region's human resources, talents, and creativity for the purposes of sustaining and growing our economy. Individuals become aware of the ACT program through our website, human resource departments at their employers, workforce development offices, um, admission advisors at one of our partner institutions or by word of mouth. We've done little formal advertising with the ACT program since it is well known and promoted by the members of New North and New Era. Retaining STEM professionals in the region and developing their talents as teachers is a goal for the ACT program, New North and New Era. Of 100 individuals admitted so far, seven hold terminal degrees, 26 a master's degree and 67 a bachelor's degree. STEM professionals admitted to the ACT program have majors in genetics, microbiology, wood and paper science, chemical engineering, geology, environmental science, economics, and mathematics, to name a few. One individual holds the PhD in mechanical engineering and 10 patents. <clears throat> These STEM professionals bring real life experiences from fields such as engineering, cartography, accounting, quality control, nuclear medicine, and statistical analysis and information technology. With the average age of individuals admitted to the ACT program being 41, many bring 15 or more years of work experience. Coursework in the ACT program is based on principles of adult learning. Online and hybrid courses allow our students maximum flexibility to remain employed until the semester they start their student teaching experience. Financial support for qualified individuals is available through two Robert Noyce National Science Foundation grants totaling $1.5 million. Individuals who qualify for a Noyce uh, receive a stipend of $13,000. We also partner with the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction on a $2.2 million U.S. Department of Education grant to increase the number of math and science teachers in Wisconsin. Both grants require recipients to teach in high-need schools for two years as a condition of accepting an award. To date, 30 individuals have completed the ACT program and are teaching. 20 have full-time teaching positions, many in high-need schools. Nine of our program completers are substitute teaching and one open to tutoring business in math. All of our program completers are place bound in the sense that they have spousal, family, and civic connections to their communities. Our students are well known to school administrators of members of their communities first and desirable as employees because of their maturity, the depth of their content knowledge, and their work experience. Thus we are producing a pool of highly qualified math and science teachers who are connected to the communities where they are likely to teach. One of the challenges our students face has to do with time management, broadly speaking. While our students have been successful learners and employees in the past, they must learn now how to balance their attention to academic preparation with demands from their work, civic and family obligations, and expectations for involvement in extracurricular duties. This challenge surfaces first during the student teaching experience and persists in the first uh, year or two of full-time employment. We're confident the STEM professionals we prepare have a level of analytic ability and human leadership skills in addition to their content knowledge that will serve their schools and the teaching profession well. Uh, preparation in a STEM profession allows ACT teachers to write integrated curriculum for local, state, or national organizations to assist co uh, colleagues in the analysis of student test data and to rigorously document the impacts of their own teaching on student learning. 
STEM professionals bring knowledge and skills to the teaching profession that traditional undergrad students do not have or have not had the time to develop. In my opinion, it would be beneficial if all STEM professionals received explicit training regarding how they can become engaged in the education of K-12 students through programs like those assembled for this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. B. Uh, I now recognize our second witness, Mrs. Christine Sutton, for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Brooks, uh, Ranking Member Lipinski. Excuse me, you'll need to turn on your microphone and move it towards you so that, there you go. All right. Good morning, Chairman Brooks, Ranking Member Lipinski, and other members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to come this morning to share my personal experience as a professional who left industry to pursue a second career in education um, at, at this hearing this morning. Uh, I have a bachelor's in industrial engineering, a master's in computer science. I worked in manufacturing automation and uh, spent 22 years in uh, industry, ending up as a program manager deploying um, transit management systems for public transit. Uh, at, by my, when I reached my mid-40s, I decided that I might want to make a change be more involved in my community, but also I really enjoyed working with students, and I think that that's something that really needs to be kept in the forefront, is that when you make the move to leave industry to become a secondary educator or any kind of educator, you're teaching students. You're not teaching your content. You may have great expertise, but you need to have the preparation and the heart to really be involved with the students, and, and so I wanted to bring that out um, as something that was really key. Um, I. Uh, ended up uh, finding a program at Johns Hopkins which would recognize my uh, previous coursework, which not a lot of industries don't recognize, a lot of in universities rather don't recognize that engineering is, uh, sig is, com is, is similar to math, and so they didn't give me the prerequisites that I would need to actually become a core math teacher. Um, but through Hopkins, I was able to get my degree, moved to Alabama, which I, where I now teach at uh, Huntsville City Schools, and I am working right now, after three years in the middle school, I now work at the high school. I teach algebra, uh, computer science, uh, advanced placement computer science, and then I also teach cybersecurity. The cybersecurity course is part of our um, Applied Math and Science Academy that we've set up in our school district. It has right now eight courses that are focused at STEM education. And um, the other courses that we have at the academy are Introduction to Engineering Design, Principles of Engineering, Digital Electronics, Principle of Biomedical Sciences, and Human Body Systems. We, um, through additional community partnerships, we added Building Science and uh, EMT training in partnership with Calhoun University. And we also have the cybersecurity class I teach, which is the pilot in the country. And it's a wonderful opportunity. It's a kind of a, a place that I was hoping that I could find to teach when I envision teaching. It gives me an opportunity to um, work with all levels of students, which I think is also very important. When you become a STEM educator, you have to be equipped to teach core courses, which are basic sciences or mathematics, so that you can strengthen the skills of the students so they can go on to succeed. And I do teach in a city school system, so I get students at all levels coming into the high school. And as a ninth grade math teacher, I have to bring them up to a level where they are in a place where they can continue their education in high school and then qualify to get accepted to good, solid STEM education programs in universities. And so as a person transitioning, you need to have the skills and the education in a, in a quality teacher preparation program, which gives you um, the tools to develop interventions, to teach students at all needs, at all levels, students with special needs, to help bring them along too. So um, I think that having solid teacher preparation is really critical to being successful as a, a STEM educator in the high school. Um, I think that um, in my situation, uh, I, was, I was very lucky that I was able to uh, have the position I have, but I also had a lot of preparation and an opportunity with the Huntsville City Schools. One of the things that I would really love to see is that if we could have the academy, which is now piloted in my high school, extended to other high schools to give other students uh, the opportunity to learn and other STEM teachers an opportunity to teach 
each of the academy classes is taught by a different instructor. We have eight instructors and we teach six other classes during the day and we have relatively large class sizes and we have a contribution to make to the school beyond just our STEM education. So I think that when we think about STEM, it has to be broader than just the technology. It has to also include teaching fundamentals to students to make them, to prepare them to be successful in STEM careers. Thank you, Mrs. Sutton. And uh, with respect to each of our witnesses, just remember to push the little talk button and have the microphone uh, closer, pointed at you instead of off to the side as, it, as they seem to have been set up before we got here. Uh, the chair now recognizes our next witness, Mrs. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Robin Wilner, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Brooks and uh, Cong Congressman Lipinski and the other members of the committee. It's a, a, a great pleasure to be here and share with you the experience from IBM. And we already, I think, have some great um, convergence here and violent agreement on what these programs should be. So it's a great panel. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, as uh, you know, I'm Robin Wilner, Vice President of Global Community Initiatives at IBM. And I have the great honor to be responsible for IBM's um, investments in our philanthropic programs around the world with a special emphasis on education, which has long been our priority. We know at IBM that we make the biggest difference when we pr provide not only our hardware, our software, the services that we're so well known for, but the talent of our IBMers. That's what really makes the difference. Um, this year, um, I hope you've heard, it was IBM Centennial this year. And as part of that, our chairman and CEO challenged IBMers around the world to do volunteer work to actually provide at least eight hours of service in the community. As a result, more than 300,000 IBMers around the world were volunteering, many of them for hundreds of hours, not just eight. And I do know that in every state represented by the committee, every state in, the, um, in America, that we had IBMers volunteering. As I said, um, they place that they are most likely to volunteer is in a school. They have a great tradition there. And that leads me into this issue of transition to teaching and the, the topic today. Uh, Congressman Lipinski already summarized much of the data that I had in my testimony on why this matters. But for IBM, we know that our future is absolutely dependent on the robust economy in the United States. And that means in the 21st century, we need STEM professionals. We need to be able to hire staff who are not only going to be capable, but are going to be innovators and leaders in the new economy. Our customers need to be able to hire people. Um, and we need to grow the, grow the economy. Um, the volunteerism that we do and, and projects like transition to teaching and second career teaching also matters to IBM so that we can attract the best employees. I'm delighted that just today Fortune magazine rated IBM as the leader, the best place for leaders to work in the United States. And part of that is because of things like transition to teaching. Um, so this is a very, very important, uh, important program for us. When we think about the kinds of students that we need to grow the economy, um, as be, has been mentioned before, of course they need to have great basic skills in math and science. But they also need, beyond the, the rudimentary skills, they need to have the social skills to work in diverse multidisciplinary teams. They need to be adaptable. They need to have leadership skills. They need communication skills to work with customers and clients and coworkers. And they need the ability to be comfortable with ambiguity, to recognize patterns among disparate data, to be inquisitive and analytical. In other words, they need fantastic teachers. IBM announced um, transition to teaching in the fall of 2005, and we started the program in 2006. We now have more than 120 IBMers who have participated, and we have 31 IBMers who have left the company and are now teaching around the country. They are our stars at IBM, the 31 who are now teaching. What exactly is transition to teaching? Well, we provide them with a stipend of $15,000. The $15,000 can be used to cover their tuition while they are still working at IBM and going to school part time. It covers all related course, coursework, all related fees, whatever costs they have to get that to complete their certification. They can also use those dollars for a stipend so that they can take a special leave of absence while they do their student teaching or other work in the classroom. That way they can maintain their benefits and they can continue with their, um, have a smooth transition. 
Um, uh, three things that I would highlight that we need to be thinking about as we go forward. We need better teacher training programs that are focused, that provide them with everything they need to know, nothing more. They're anxious to get into the classroom, but nothing less because they need to be prepared. We encourage them to be in the classroom. We encourage them to get the skills of being a teacher, not just their basic math and science skills. We also need to make sure that when they do student teaching, that they're working with qualified teachers, with mentors, with real master teachers so that they're learning the best. And we also need to make sure that they, when they get into the classroom, that they have ongoing support and mentoring. By the way, online t technology and social networking can help make that happen in a very efficient way and in a much cheaper way. Um, I see that my time's running out, and I was hoping that I could also talk a little bit about P-TECH, which is a new program that we've just started this fall, where IBMers are not only pro providing mentorships, but we're also bringing the students from this career program into our workplace, giving them work-based learning, and preparing them directly for good-paying careers in the IT sector. So hopefully I can cover that uh, in the question period. Thank you, Ms. Wilner. We may have that opportunity uh, towards the end, too. Uh, we next recognize Mr. Jason Morella for five minutes. Chairman Brooks, Ranking Member Lipinski, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear before you today. Fifteen years ago, I began teaching at a continuation high school in San Jose, California, for students that were not succeeding at other area high schools. These students had very little desire to finish high school and very little confidence in themselves. The school was able to enter two different robotics programs thanks to grants made available by NASA. I was honored when the principal asked me to be the teacher and the coach for those teams, but I later learned that I was the equivalent of Mikey from the Life Serial commercials, as the rest of the faculty had already passed on the offer and said, ask the new naive teacher, Jason, he'll do it. I probably should have known I wasn't the first choice because I was not a science or technology teacher. I was an English and social studies teacher, so I should have seen that coming. To make a long story short, I was in over my head, but thankfully three amazing engineers from, Na from the NASA Ames Research Facility volunteered their time to come to the school a couple days a week and work with us. With their help, we were able to build the robots for both programs and even won some competitions. But what mattered was the impact that the engineers had on those students. Previously, the students thought they just weren't smart enough to ever consider pursuing a career in STEM. But after working with those professionals, the students looked at STEM careers and their education in a new light. During the past 15 years, I have had the opportunity to be on almost every side of this topic. I've been a teacher working with mentors in various programs. I've overseen programs designed to encourage mentors to work with schools. And I now oversee the Robotics Education and Competition Foundation, which is dedicated to advancing science, technology, engineering, and math through robotics programs. Many of you probably have schools in your districts that participate in one or more of the great robotics programs that are out there. Best Robotics, Bot Ball, Underwater Robotics, First Robotics, or the VEX Robotics Competition, which is now the largest and fastest growing middle and high school robotics competition in the United States and the world. There are many differences between these programs, cost, resources required, curriculum, but what's most important is what they actually have in common. They are all project-based STEM programs that excite and motivate students, and they are all volunteer-driven programs that rely on building a strong relationship an educational relationship and partnership between schools, teachers, parents, and professional mentors from industry. Competitions put the students and mentors in situations where they have a challenge to solve. They don't have enough time. They don't have the time they would like. They don't have the funding they would like. And they're competing against others who are trying to reach a better solution faster. It's real life. By working with and observing professional mentors, students see that problem solving is an iterative process. That in the real world, it's not just a matter of knowing the answer. It's how you work with others, how you communicate, how you innovate, and that you don't give up when an idea that you have doesn't work. Students can't learn these skills just in the classroom and by taking tests. While it's easy to focus on the knowledge that industry professionals possess, I would argue that it's their presence that has the most influence. They become role models, not just mentors. Students frequently look towards these mentors for advice and guidance. They ask them about colleges to provide letters of recommendation and are commonly listed as references on applications and job applications. An even bigger impact is that these mentors has hel have helped redefine STEM fields and careers in the eyes of the students. They show students that normal people can be really smart and still be cool and that there are mm -hmm. lots of interesting and exciting jobs out there waiting just for those kinds of people. 
Our foundation is very fortunate to work with some of the top corporations, government organizations, and academic institutions in our country who support STEM-based programs. Companies like Autodesk, EMC, Northrop Grumman, Microchip, and government agencies like NASA. They support these programs and encourage their employees to go into the classroom to mentor students. And the difference they make is incredible. They don't do it only because it's a good, responsible thing to do. They do it because it's in their best interest. They're worried about the future workforce and making sure that they can find enough qualified graduates coming out of college with STEM degrees. However, there are challenges associated with industry professionals getting involved in the classroom. I have seen industry mentors have a great deal of success working in the classroom, but I have also seen situations where the experience did not go well. There are issues that can become significant barriers to becoming a classroom mentor, some of these being time, resources, experience, or credentials, which I'll be happy to expand on during the hearing. In closing, we need to engage, inspire, and prepare students to pursue science, engineering, and technology in higher education and as a profession. Getting industry professionals to volunteer or work with teachers and students is an invaluable tool to reach those goals. Whether it's a robotics competition or another hands-on project-based challenge, Having real life industry professionals work with schools makes STEM relevant to students. And relevancy drives engagement, inspiration, and action. Teachers, parents, mentors, and companies working together can help inspire and prepare students of today to become the science and engineering workforce of tomorrow. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Mr. Morello. The chair now recognizes our final witness, Dr. Jennifer Jones, for five minutes. Thank you to the subcommittee for this opportunity to speak today. I am Dr. Jennifer Jones, a principal clinical scientist at Abbott in Santa Clara, California. Abbott is a global broad-based healthcare company devoted to the discovery, development, manufacturing, marketing of pharmaceuticals and medical products. I'm here today because I have a passion for science and science education and the impact that we as science professionals can have on our community. I know firsthand what it feels like to work with children and parents who have never met a real scientist, to see the excitement in their faces when they realize a real scientist can actually look like them. I see the profound impact that mentoring has on my colleagues. And because of my own positive experience with mentors, I believe we have an obligation to serve the generations to come. And I am pleased to be part of a program that provides a solid framework for the effect of mentoring. The science education program at Abbott and at the Abbott Fund, our philanthropic foundation, are an example of the kind of public-private partnerships that can serve as a catalyst, inspiring an interest in science in young people, teachers, and enriching the professional lives of scientists. By engaging in rigorous research and thorough preparation, we offer programs that have a long-lasting impact on the participants involved. These partnerships are critical in leveraging existing existing effective delivery models and for providing expertise in innovative science content and exposure to STEM careers. I see on a daily basis the need for innovation in solving some of the greatest problems that face us as a nation and as a global community. Yet we are lagging behind developed countries. In the Program for International Student Assessment, PISA rankings, the U.S. is average low behind top performers such as Canada, Finland, Japan, China. We are average, yet average will not work in solving the 21st century problems. As Secretary of State, uh, Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan stated, after the release of the rankings, being average in reading and science and below average in math is not nearly good enough in a knowledge economy where scientific technological literacy is so central to sustaining innovation and international competitiveness. Even more sobering is a large gap in U.S. rankings between low socioeconomic students and their high socioeconomic classmates. We need these students not only to be better than average at math and science, but we need them to be better, more knowledgeable, and more innovative than those of us in science today. The Global Science Forum of the Organization of Economic and Cooperation and Development, OECD, advocated that providing positive exposure to science at an early age is critical to inspiring future interest. I know firsthand the impact of bringing scientists to directly together with families from underserved communities. One of the schools we work with is Brookfield Elementary School in Oakland, California. 
They are an example of a school that struggles to provide the basic resources, much less serving as an inspiration for their students. The day prior to our first program, they were robbed of all their electronic and compu computer equipment, yet we still had the event bringing together scientists and families. The principal, Adam Taylor, has seen an increase in participation of parents in their children's education, an increase in the willingness and comfort of, of teachers to work with scientific activities with their students, and an increase in the school's overall science scores. For an event such as this to be effective, we recognize the need to invest in professional development that can prepare our scientists to effectively serve as mentors. The Abbott and the Abbott Fund programs span the K through 12 STEM learning spectrum. The Abbott Family Science programs start in elementary school and encourage the critical parent-child interaction around science. Abbott scientists and volunteers serve as facilitators. Abbott Operation Discovery brings middle school students together with scientists in a working lab environment to engage in hands-on experiments that complement the school curriculum. We also support Project Exploration, a nonprofit organization serving minority and female students at a time when they are most vulnerable to losing interest in science, technology, engineering, and math. High school students serve by programs such as after School Matters, a Chicago-based after-school internship program, and the FIRST Robotics program. Abbott scientists, again, serve as facilitators and mentors for these programs. Our support includes the presence in science and children's room museums, where a broad range of public audiences can be reached. The new traveling science exhibition, Science Plus You, for young children was created in partnership with the Cole Children's, children's Museum, and scientists were actively involved in the development of exhibits and serve as active activity facilitators. Collectively, these programs have reached millions of students, parents, and teachers. The Abbott Fund has invested in a program structure based on training best practices and a rigorous understanding of the impact on the program's participants. The methodology applies to the professional development we provide to scientists as well as the evaluation of the impact of the programs on the participants. Best practices identified in national projects and in formal science education field are continually being applied to our training model for scientists. We encourage active student and family engagement and discovery of science rather than giving lectures and demonstrations. We modify programs based on the particular needs of the community, and this model increases the Abbott's Abbott scientists' capacity to train other volunteers and serve as internal and external ambassadors. Regarding the program impacts, we have found significant change in participants' interest in science following participation in Abbott Family Science and Operation Discovery. Abbott Family Science has shown to increase participants reporting more a likelihood of engaging with scientific activities from 39% to 84%. Lastly, in closing, recently an Abbott colleague said, uh, had a comment about people he has mentored. These people are now better than me, and that is the way it should be. That is what we should be striving to, enabling our students, our children, to be better than us, to accomplish more than we could ever imagine. So we hope with this testimony, it will serve as an example of identifying the most effective ways to prepare STEM professionals for effective and transformational interactions with students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to thank the entire panel for their testimony, uh, reminding members that committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. The chair will at this point open the round of questions, and I recognize myself in that regard. My first question is directed to Mrs. Sutton. Uh, Mrs. Sutton, interacting with other more conventional teachers, have you found that your teaching style and tools are different because of your industry experience from outside the classroom? And if so, how? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Sharon Brooks. Um, yes, I've found that I do have, I do employ a number of different techniques that they don't use. I feel more comfortable in developing uh, targeted interventions. I can use um, different kinds of uh, software applications to pull together tests that are not just straight from the curriculum but can be custom made and I also deliver um, my lessons with some animation and some different kinds of things that uh, attract the students and keep their attention while I'm trying to um, teach them why they don't even notice they're being taught. As a follow-up, uh, how much freedom are you given to either alter or expand your curriculum, if any? Oh, I'm given tremendous freedom. 
we have a mandate that we have to help these kids um, gain proficiency and now they're in high school they have to pass the graduation exam and we know where they're weak we test them regularly and we we are called to do whatever it takes to bring them up to the level they need to be in my computer science and the cybersecurity classes i get free reign to do whatever i think i need to bringing projects in from my industry experience and from my peers so that um, i can enrich what's going on in my classroom thank you dr b in your testimony you mentioned that act partners with the wisconsin department of public instruction to increase the number of math and science teachers in wisconsin can you tell us more about the relationship between the Department of Public Instruction and ACT? Um, the the uh, Department of Public Instruction in Wisconsin approves all teacher licensure programs, so they, um, they actually are encouraging some alternative pathways. There are uh, 12 alternative programs in the state of Wisconsin at this time. Uh, ACT is the only one that's devoted exclusively to math and science, while some of the, some of the other ones do uh, as well. So they're, they're primarily in a, an approval body, but also a, a body that's trying to stimulate more of this kind of work. Was it complicated to obtain approval from the state of Wisconsin for the ACT Alternative Certification Program? Um, and also, in that regard, can you explain the process? It, uh, it wasn't complicated, but being in a college of education and human services, we do these kinds of things on a fairly regular basis, so we're familiar with the process. Um, and uh, the second part of your question, and I'll go back to it. Can you explain the process? Um, you, have to, uh, you have to apply and you have to indicate uh, who will be involved in teaching these individuals, what their credentials are, what the curriculum will be for the program, <clears throat> how you will support the program to get it started budgetarily and uh, in the event that the program is not successful and students remain uh, in the program. Um, <clears throat> we go through a re review process uh, 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 annually, we have a visit from a liaison from the Department of Public Instruction who comes to hear about where we're at in our program. We have uh, formal reviews that occur uh, periodically um, as well. So, Thank you. And Ms. Wilner, uh, you had wanted some additional time to complete your remarks. Go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Microphone on. Thank you very much, Chairman. I appreciate that. Um, I, I just did want to add that in addition to transition to teaching, which has been so successful and brought so many great IBMers into the community, we have recently started a program. Just this September, we launched a new school in Brooklyn, New York, in collaboration with the City of New York. Um, the Department of Education, the City University of New York, and it's a, a unique model that goes from grades 9 to 14. So the students actually receive a high school diploma and an associate's degree and will be prepared to take a job that leads to a good paying career in the IT industry. And we've actually mapped our job skills for real jobs that we hire at IBM with an associate's degree and worked with the faculty to make sure that the young people will be prepared. Um, so we think that that's the essence of making real on the promise to our children that they will be college and career ready. And we are now starting to replicate the model in Chicago, working with uh, Mayor Emanuel, and we are hoping to be putting out a range of tools and playbooks on exactly how to use this model to energize secondary and post-secondary education around the country. Thank you, Ms. Wilner. Uh, the Chair's time is about to expire. With that, I recognize Mr. Lipinski for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to start with, uh, with, with Dr. Jones. Certainly, uh, we're here to, to learn about uh, how we can uh, really help uh, scientists make a successful leap. You know, as part of it, make a successful leap from scientist to classroom mentor or to teacher. I just wanted to uh, ask you what best practices are taught um, in order to help Abbott scientists make that uh, make that leap, and I, I also wanted to see what um, recommendations you might have along those lines for what the federal government could do to support scientists at our national labs uh, doing something similar. Okay, well, I can answer the first part of the question. So, as we talked about applying best practices and training, and so what uh, the Abbott Fund has done is participated in national projects which um, detail specific critical elements that will help scientists such as myself as make that transition. We are 
doing informal, we're in um, informal settings, therefore we learn to take our knowledge and what we know and convey it and apply it to a setting of students in schools or outside the school, such as in museums, such as some of the museum projects that I talked to in collaboration with the Cole uh, Children's Museum. Now, regarding the fed what the federal government can do, I, I don't believe that I can actually speak on that. I, I just assume that they're probably, you know, you have people with similar backgrounds that just have to, have to be working for the federal government, what types of things that Abbott does that oh, okay. the federal government may, may also do those types of things as a, an employer to help, uh, you know, federal scientists make that same sort of, uh, do that same sort of work. Well, and some of the ideas that um, are, what we've used in our models is, one thing that is key is teaching the scientists to use their personal experience to, as an example, for the student. Uh, we have to remember that in, in the classroom sometimes, science can be very abstract to all of us, but during pro with programs such as Abbott Family Science, we were able to take that abstract and apply it to real world and what many of us do on a regular basis. So again, taking the best practices, taking the tools learned from many of these national projects, from agencies that actually teach informal science education, and then applying that to those employees who will be serving as volunteers in those classroom or outside of the classroom settings. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to move on to uh, Ms. Wilner. You had mentioned, uh, you, and you had the opportunity to uh, really talk more about this in the question from the, the chairman about, the, about p -Tech, and I'm happy to hear that uh, about p -Tech, uh, being replicated in, in Chicago. Uh, can you tell me what types of skill sets p -Tech focuses on and what jobs you hope that, that they will, will fill? Great. Thank you very much. Um, so we started out the program by actually looking at IBM and we identified every single job where we would hire with an associate's degree. And we know from some of the research actually that you quoted that even students with an associate's degree in a STEM area will earn more than their colleagues who get a bachelor's degree in another non-STEM area. So that's really fruitful. And we didn't include minimum wage dead-end jobs. We only looked at entry-level jobs that would really lead to a career, start them on the path to a career so they could raise a family. That's our, you know, our, our benchmark. Um, they will be working in support. Some of them will be doing um, um, customer support. Some of them will be doing programming, website design. There are a whole range of programs. And so we're working with the faculty to look at exactly those skills both the rudimentary math and science, the engineering, the programming. But most exciting in this program is that they're also taking a work-based competency strand, starting in ninth grade. Every one of them has an IBM mentor. They will start visiting IBM sites um, in two weeks. They're going to be coming to IBM Research. They will actually, we're working with the state education department to get approval to get credit-bearing workplace experience. Because we believe that when these young people come to an IBM site, not just to shadow somebody, but to actually solve a problem, do some work, that should help them earn credits. So it will be a very integrated program, rich in academics, rich in workplace environment. They're going to learn how to take supervision, work in teams, and they're, they're going to be excited about knowing that every day they're getting closer to a real career. Uh, is this because IBM is having trouble finding people, uh, workers in the United States who are qualified? Is IBM outsourcing jobs because you can't find workers here in, in the U.S. who are, who are qualified? But, you know, I think this is a worldwide problem. We are always looking for the best, uh, the best employees. They need to have great skills. And as I mentioned before, we want those leaders who will actually invent the next best thing and, and take us into the innovation. So, you know, everywhere that IBM has a business, we're looking to help with education. But absolutely in the United States, where, where our roots are, where we're headquartered, where we've been for 100 years, we want to make sure that we continue to be a leader. And that means we need to invest in education here in, in every state. Thank you. My time's up. I'll yield back. The chair next recognizes Mr. Bartlett of Maryland for his five minutes. Thank you. Uh, next year will be the uh, 60th anniversary of my doctorate in science from the University of Maryland. 
uh, and I already had four years of full-time teaching experience when I got my uh, doctorate. I went to uh, Washington Missionary College in 1943 with no interest in science. I was going to be a uh, medical missionary. And to be that, I had to have a degree in theology, which I acquired, and I had to go to medical school, so I took some pre-med courses. I had a really good teacher, Dr. Freeman Quimby, who ended up the chief scientist at the Library of Congress. And I was so inspired by his teaching that I took all the courses he offered and enough more courses that when I graduated in 1947, I had a major in Bible, a minor in homiletics, that's theology, and I had a major in biology and a minor in uh, chemistry. I was 21 years old, I looked 17, I had decided to go into the ministry, but you don't have a, much of a, an immediate bright future in the ministry looking 17 and not being married. So they uh, suggested I go to graduate school until I got older and got married. And uh, I was there for five years and got my doctorate. That was one teacher who changed a life. Uh, my youngest of 10 children was really a problem. He uh, wouldn't study. Immediately got home, he went out to the shop to make uh, toys on, with, with our saws out there. Uh, we, every year we'd argue, should we hold Ross back? He really doing just awful. And then Ross had a uh, science teacher in the seventh grade. He got turned on. He found that he really could do it. He got inspired. Ross ended up uh, number one of 185 uh, graduating engineers at UMBC and he went on to get his doctorate at Carnegie Mellon. Here was another life that was drastically changed by a good science teacher. We have another son who was a blue baby at birth and Fred was in a school where they spent three times as much on his education as they did on Ross's education. We almost lost Ross. He could have ended up a druggie somewhere. We're just so darn lucky for that teacher that, that turned him on. I worked uh, eight years for IBM, by the way. Uh, just a little anecdote, that was a very different IBM than you're familiar with. Dr. Pete Castruccio was starting a new department, and he would go out without collaboration with the, uh, with the personnel uh, office, and he would hire people. So the personnel would walk around, and when they saw a new face, they'd introduce themselves, and the person would say, oh, I just started working here for Dr. Pete Castruccio. Well, you maybe ought to come to the personnel office and sign some papers so you get paid <laughs> then. Uh, I transitioned from IBM. I went, by the way, from teaching and basic research to, uh, to uh, uh, the engineering world where I was awarded uh, 20 patents, and I culminated that with my career in IBM, and I transitioned back to teaching even then 36 years ago. This year, IBM was very interested in transitioning people back to teaching, and uh, so you had a long, long career in, in, in doing that. This year, the Chinese will graduate seven times as many engineers as we graduate. Half of our graduating uh, students here are, about half of them are Chinese students. We face a huge challenge. There is no way that we're going to continue to be the premier economic and military power in the world if a potential adversary, competitor, is graduating seven times as many, many engineers as we're graduating. The fundamental problem in our country is a cultural problem, and I'm going to ask you to submit something for the record because you won't have time in my allotted five minutes. But the problem we have here is a cultural problem. The people going to these pursuits are not appreciated. Bright young men are called geeks and nerds. They were squares, by the way, when I was going to school. Now they're geeks and nerds, and pretty girls won't date them. And uh, bright girls play dumb to get a date. You know, this isn't very bright for a culture, is it? When was the last time you remember the White House inviting an academic achiever there and slobbering all over them the way they do sports figures and entertainers? Before we have our best and brightest students go into careers in science, math, and engineering, they're going to have to believe that this is something appreciated by their society. It is not. We have got to change that. We are at risk as a country if we can't change that. Please, for the record, would you provide some counsel to us as to what we might do from this committee to help in changing this culture in our country so that this is appreciated. Our brightest, brightest and best students now are increasingly going into law and political science. I tell them these are potentially destructive pursuits. 
We have enough of both of those. Thank you. We need to do something so these bright kids want to go into science, math, and engineering. Please help us. And I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bartlett. Next, we have Mr. Clark of Michigan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. You know, if a um, gentleman from Maryland would like, I could yield him some of my time. Well, I hope that they will provide it. I hope that our panel will provide a very thoughtful recommendation to us, because this is really a very serious thing. We face a couple really uh, big challenges in our country. One is with energy, another is with our huge uh, economic problems, our deficit, our debt. You know, but the solution out of both of these might be science, math, and engineering, might it not? Maybe, maybe you could bring some manufacturing back to this country. You know, it's now leaving. Every 12 hours, we have another billion-dollar trade deficit. That's only half, by the way, because about every six hours, we have another billion-dollar uh, budget deficit, which increases our debt. And, you know, we are here because we have been failing in this area. Our jobs have been going overseas. And so we really need to change the culture in our country. It's got to be appreciated. You know, a culture gets what it appreciates. You know, I think of Rome and the gladiators, and I'm concerned for our future. Thank you very much, and help if you can. In any event, I just learned a lot listening from the gentleman from Maryland. And one thing, I would agree with you. I think we've got too many lawyers here in Congress. Either scientists or artists like me would be a great combination here. I've got to bite my tongue. I'm an artist that also has a lot of grace. So, As an attorney, uh, I think your time just expired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. My apologies, Mr. Chair. Uh, this question is uh, more for Mr. Morella because he actually raised it at the end of his uh, uh, oral testimony. You indicated that sometimes industry mentors may have difficulty working in the classroom, and you um, stated that sometimes a industry mentor could be effective in the classroom if they take the role analogous to a coach, where they may or may not need educational credentials in the classroom. When do you think it's appropriate for an industry mentor to get the credential they need in order to be effective in the classroom and how would you compare that role with a industry mentor that works as a coach in the classroom and works as a coach effectively just so i can get the distinction based on your experience on when you need a educational credential to be effective in the classroom and when you don't sure yeah that's a great question um there's there's a wide spectrum there too it, it depends on on what the goal of that mentor is going to be and i would say when they absolutely need to get the credential and go through that process is obviously if they're going to want to be a full-time educator and if they're going to want to be doing that on their own alone if they're not working in conjunction with a teacher that's in the class or with an existing team or program um, when i talked about coaching and i think in the written testimony i had mentioned what I've seen happen a lot is um, industry professionals who want to get into education and help educators or help work with students. Um, the coach analogy is similar to sports. Um, you see students in high schools who get to work with um, people who played professional football or basketball or baseball, and they come and they coach the teams after school. They don't need a credential, right? They get a stipend. They can work with the, with the schools, with the students. They're not required to have a credential because they've got the expertise. Um, I think that that's a possible solution to help mentors and engineers from companies come and work in a classroom and work with students that maybe they don't need the full-time credential, but what they can do is be on that kind of coaching level, get a stipend. Um, the key is to work with a teacher, with a teacher that's in the classroom. It's two totally different worlds. You know, coming from the corporate world, that environment, and going into a classroom, um, an analogy I use is kind of like a, a ship, right? The corporate world is like a cruise ship, and you've got a lot of employees working on different decks, trying to make sure that everything works in the best way possible in a profitable way to get everybody from point A to B. Um, Teaching is more like being on a pirate ship. It's um, you know, and it's and it's leaking. You know, um, your goal is to get the students to land without the ship sinking and hopefully without a mutiny. Um, 
And, and what's, what I've seen happen with some professionals that come into the classroom is they're not prepared for that environment for the, you know, without the hierarchy and the structure. And it really does take, I think a couple of panelists mentioned, it takes patience, it takes uh, experience, it takes resolve, it takes um, getting involved with the students and listening. And um, I think it's important that they work with experienced teachers and they go through the process to kind of learn what it takes to teach. And if they want to pursue that full time, then I think that's when, to answer your question, they need to then pursue a credential so that they can do it full time. But if they don't want to do it full time, I think we can find ways that they can work in the classroom without needing a credential. Thank you, Mr. Morello. I'll yield back my time. The chair next recognizes Ms. Sewell uh, from the great state of Alabama. She's also an attorney. If you need any additional rebuttal time, please let me know. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, and welcome all of our panelists. I especially want to uh, um, say how delighted I am to, rep uh, to see a fellow Alabamian and Mrs. Uh, Sutton, and I actually have a question for you. Um, looking back on your educational and professional experience, um, what do you think is the, was the most, has been the most beneficial experience that you've had in relating um, your, that experience to the classroom and making that transition? I know that the Hopkins program that you were a part of, um, did it, was, are there recommendations that you can give to other programs about how they can um, better uh, educate professionals to make that transition into the classroom? Uh, yes, I, uh, my experience was unique in that I did study with Johns Hopkins and then moved to Alabama where I had my student teaching experience. And the Johns Hopkins program that I selected was a part-time program at night and it was staffed by a universe, um, Montgomery C County Schools educators and administrators. So they were working, a lot of the people there were working uh, in the schools every day and then coming to teach us at night and they really helped prepare us for the environment that we were going to be entering. For example, um, at the time Montgomery County had over 140 languages being spoken in the school system. I didn't even know there were 140 languages. So just that awareness of you know, what um, my students were going to be like when I got there was really, really important. And yes, they recognized what we had, but they also knew that without having strategies, and there was very fo focused, targeted instruction to help us build on what we already had, but how to change it up so that we could present material to children in a way that they would be able to grasp it and to reinforce and to bring it back in different ways because you do have to tell them sometimes 20 times or more before it does sink in. I mean that's just part of what it, what it takes to be a teacher, to be creative enough and think of enough different applications for what you're trying to <clears throat> deliver that they are exposed to it over and over again so that they really truly understand it and then can be again, begin to apply it themselves. You know I'm really interested in um, how and and all the panelists, uh, either one, anyone can answer this question. I'm very interested in scaling these kinds of programs, uh, mentorship programs, uh, transition programs, to rural areas of America. Um, I know, Ms. Sutton, you have the benefit of being in Huntsville, and Huntsville is a, a science and tech uh, hub for the state of Alabama. I represent a lot of the rural counties in Alabama, and you know, our kids need to be sparked and interested in, as well. How, what recommendations would you all uh, make on how to scale uh, these effective programs uh, to rural Alabama and rural America? If I can, one, one idea um, is that at IBM we have an online mentoring program. We have about 6,500 IBMers who are mentoring students. Um, and something that's unique about it is that we adopt a class. So every child in that class receives a mentor, and then we work with the teacher. So it's actually clued into supporting their classroom work. They meet the, the uh, students meet their mentor at the beginning. We have a big kickoff, and then we have a pizza party at the end. But in between, it's online mentoring. And that does help with your, I mean, we still need infrastructure in the schools, but there's a lot of reasons why we want to bring technology infrastructure to the rural schools. And that way they can, they can have mentors, they can also have access to a lot of the experiences of the world. So, so that's, that's one thing that, that we might want to consider. Ms. Jones, how could I encourage some of the, uh, um, the big corporations like Abbott and others that may have satellite offices in Huntsville, Alabama, to come and be interested in rural Alabama and rural areas? 
Well, um, first I think we'd have to look at location, mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> but one thing that um, if we can use an example is our um, Abbott Family Science Program and uh, Operation Discovery is that the whole objective is this informal out of school setting, okay, to uh, encourage and spark that interest in the students. Uh, when we talk about STEM education, there's actually new published information that details that it's not taking the math or science courses all the time, mm -hmm. but it's doing other things to spark the education of the, or the almost inspiration of the student. Um, we actually have um, three goals that we have focused on with uh, our work in science education, and one of them is just engaging the student and the families, okay, that connection, as well as the teachers and general science exploration, and that's what we hope that our programs can do, science exploration. And the second, actually, if I may go on, is encouraging the young people to be more proficient in science and that, that attracts more scientists to the field, okay? And then lastly, it's also building these partnerships I talked about in my testimony, the public-private partnership. So if we can continue that, and take it to the next level. I think we can tap into some of the communities that you speak of. Thank you. I want to encourage all of our panelists to really be forward thinking on how to increase uh, participation um, as well as how to scale that which has worked in other areas um, to rule uh, out America as well as uh, to underserved communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sewell, for your insight and questions. Next, the chair recognizes Mr. Sarbanes of Maryland for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank you to you all for being here. This is a really interesting topic. It's something I was involved with quite a bit before I got here. I worked with uh, Leadership Maryland, which is a group of business and other leaders um, in our state, for a number of years in designing a career changer uh, program. In fact, they did a they did kind of a summit at one point on ways to impact education. And the, the piece that came out of it and was sustained the longest was this idea of uh, career changers coming out of you know, other walks of life and into teaching and, and all the challenges that that can present, obviously. Um, and you've spoken, I know, to the issues of how you give credit for life and work experience that you know, may not fit into the the typical credentialing uh, process and how you can affect a smooth transition for people actually want to change careers. But you've also spoken to all the other permutations of partnership that can be developed to help bring to bear in the classrooms around STEM education the experience and expertise and frankly life perspective that a lot of these professionals have, even without them necessarily making a full uh, transition. We've got a, there's a there's a partnership now between the National Commission on Teaching in America's Future and NASA Goddard uh, Space Flight Center um, to create this NASA 21st Century Learning Studio model. And there's a couple of schools in my district that are benefiting from this partnership, which basically brings um, Goddard professionals and scientists into these team. Uh, project uh, learning um, opportunities in the schools and I went to visit a couple of them and you know it's brought the school to life really when it comes to STEM education the, the, the kids are wowed by it the teachers in the schools um, are also benefiting tremendously from this partnership and it turns out the scientists themselves are benefiting because they're discovering because they're they're needing to think about their subject matter in different ways and, and teach what they know. They're then going back to Goddard and it's, it's, it's having a, a benefit for them in terms of how they interact and team with their own colleagues there. So it's important to note that the benefits of this kind of partnering uh, really cut across all of, the, uh, all of the participants. So I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, Dr. Beeth, um, because you, had, you have this innovative program, the ACT program, which is helping people make this transition. 
how much progress is being made? I looked at the numbers, but as against, say, the shortage of STEM teachers, particularly in high schools that may exist in, in that state, in your state, um, you know, how much progress you're making sort of filling the shortages or addressing in a significant way the shortages overall with these programs? Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's a, that's a good question and an interesting question. Because of the nature of this program with people being place bound, we fill shortages locally, mm -hmm. but uh, we're not reaching out to all parts of the state uh, to fill the shortages in some of the rural areas and some of the more uh, high need urban areas right. in the state. So. And then I wanted to ask Ms. Wilner, I know IBM has had a really innovative approach to this for a long time. Maybe you could speak, is there a, is there a process by which as people are um, approaching retirement within IBM that they get surveyed or canvassed for their potential interest in this and then um, you're starting to provide support and partner with credentialing institutions and other, you know, in terms of the pedagogy that they may need as a threshold matter um, before they actually hit retirement. So they're, you're, you're kind of getting this cohort ready to go out and do the partnership, but before they actually retire. That, that's exactly right, Congressman. So we want to make sure that our employees have a smooth transition and are able to continue to have a salary. They're working at IBM while they're getting their coursework completed. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we actually have a special leave of absence. They can hold on to their mm -hmm. benefits. Because one of the things we hear about career changers is that there's that gap. I leave right. one job, and then before I get placed as a teacher, you know, I still need health insurance, and I still need to, to hold things together. So we cover those bridges for them. And we want to make sure that they've been in the classroom and uh, had real classroom experience. I think some of my colleagues talked about math and science expertise is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Right. And you can't just throw somebody into a classroom. They really need that practice. So this leave of absence that we've constructed allows them to do that. So they're really prepared. We want them to start teaching day one, not, you know, because those kids, mm -hmm. they only get one time through, right. you know, eighth grade. Or well, that, grade. That's, that's, that's a terrific part of your, your program. And my time's up, but I just did want to make the point that uh, it's, it's equally important that the schools where these career changers are placed are themselves prepared and ready to accommodate and are willing participants in this kind of a partnership or else it, it won't work from that standpoint either. And I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, next, the chair recognizes Mr. Tonko of New York for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Beeth, uh, we often focus on the importance of STEM uh, teacher recruitment and preparation, uh, but we also know that STEM teacher retention uh, can be a huge problem. Um, so, so many of our STEM teachers leave the teaching field, I'm told, in the first five years, often citing a lack of professional support and resources. Recognizing that the ACT program is fairly young, have you uh, made any efforts to uh, track the teachers that participate in the program um, and use that tracking to see you know, where they end up and whether or not they persist uh, to serve as STEM uh, teachers? Mm -hmm. The, um, <clears throat> the, the first uh, person who completed our program is in his fourth year of teaching, so we are still a fairly young kind of program to have any sort of longitudinal data, but uh, I, I had indicated in the, in the previous testimony that uh, all of the people who have completed our program are teaching or substitute teaching and seeking jobs. They're all interested in still being in the teaching field. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ms. Wilner, I heard your exchange with Representative Sarbanes. Can you develop for me a little more the, uh, the interest or the, uh, the thinking of IBM when it decided to join the uh, Change the Equation Network and what value you see in partnering with the federal government on STEM education? Great. Thank, thank you, Congressman. Um, for us, th this is actually a business decision. 
and I think my colleague from Abbott would say the same thing, that we know that the future of IBM is absolutely connected to having a strong economy, and that means we need you know, we, we need to have a citizenry that's well prepared, and we particularly need engineers, scientists, mathematicians who are going to, you know, keep us moving forward in the 21st century, who are going to be great IBM employees, who are going to be great employees for our customers, um, and in every way are going to contribute to that economy. So for us, it's, it is a financial imperative and a long-term investment. Um, we also see, it's very interesting, when we announced transition to teaching, I think I mentioned that we've had a little bit more than 120 participants at IBM. But our CEO received literally thousands of emails when we announced it, not because everybody wanted to become a teacher tomorrow, but because they said, I love working for a company that wants to do this. That's a great thing for IBM to do, to connect with our schools. Um, so I, I think that you see that there's a very shared interest in this from our employees, and so that's part of it as well. Our employees love to volunteer. They love being part of Change the Equation and learning best practices because they want to make a difference. Um, for an employee at IBM, going to a career day and talking about being an engineer, the best thing they could do. They love that. And they love that we support them and make it easy. Thank you. Um, can you also cite for me, and this question I would toss out to the entire panel, um, it seems as though elementary settings are important uh, for, if not a number of reasons, prime amongst them, many adults fear science and math. And so I think sometimes that is just an in, it's kind of it's sort of a, a taught dynamic so that when you're really young in the elementary settings, somehow you pick up on this message that you have to fear science and math. Can you cite for me any uh, success stories or great models that are utilized in the elementary setting? It seems when we get to the middle and high school years, we may address the problem then, but if we start in that elementary setting, and get them into science and math, then we can have hope that that'll continue to grow through the education spiral. So any elementary formats or programs that you would want to cite that are really a good working tool? Well, um, currently Abbott Family Science is focused on the elementary population. And um, the way that that works is that we know that there's data to support that parents' involvement in their children's scientific understanding and engagement is critical and that's what it's based on and what the Abbott volunteers and scientists just truly do is we serve as facilitators but again we're able to take scientific pr principles scientific concepts and truly apply them to what we do as a company as far as our our innovation our discovery and so I think that parents and children are able to make that link and leap and actually, we have some metrics that we're gathering that have shown that um, the engagement uh, that occurs between parent and children as a family afterwards increases from like 39% to 84%. So they're going away from this and realizing that, oh, wait, I can engage with my family on a regular basis with science. Anyone else have a, a doctor? Um, I, I do. And not, uh, I, this is a school-based program. But in 1992, there was a, a, a teacher who worked for a summer in a plant pathology lab, a fifth grade teacher, who really didn't want to know about plant pathology, but wanted to know how scientists tell their stories. And so he went back to his classroom and started a program called I Wonder. In 1992, they published the first journal, I Wonder, the uh, journal for elementary school scientists. It's still in publication today. Um, this, and it now has expanded to incorporate a number of different schools. Many of the articles that the students write in this, uh, in this journal uh, have more to do with engineering than they do with basic science, but it seems appropriate. And also with the, the common core standards that are coming, it might be a nice model. Um, the, uh, the teachers write an afterword in this journal every year as to what they learned about teaching um, their students this science. Um, I have a proposal in right now to uh, go back and now take a retrospective look at the children who went through this program and see how it impacted uh, the number of science courses they took and the kinds of careers that, uh, that they might be engaged in. Wonderful. Is there time for one more? Okay. Um, your question actually comes back to something that um, Congressman Bartlett also said earlier, um, specific to elementary school levels. and. 
Um, we work with a uh, foundation based in Omaha and Nebraska called the Create Foundation, and they do a, a, a junior level robotics after school program for schools in the Omaha area. Um, and what, what I would, to answer your question, I would say that at the elementary school level, it's about interest and demand, not about what they actually need to learn in science and technology and engineering. You need to get the kids excited about it, and it's a culture thing. And um, an observation I'll share from my experience teaching is I think people lose sight of the fact that as kids grow up, especially at elementary school, and I feel guilty right now just thinking about my kids, parents always show up to cheer for them at a soccer game, a baseball game, you know, basketball, um, whatever, a walkathon, a fun ride, whatever it may be. Students never get cheered, they, they never get celebrated for getting a right answer, right? Their parents, the people they're trying to impress, never get to see them do well in school. Parents aren't there in the classroom. They don't see them get 100% on a spelling test and get to clap for them, but they'll clap for them when they hit a ball with a bat. What these programs can do in elementary school, if you can do these hands-on programs, is they treat robotics and other programs, it's not just about robotics, to the kids it's a sport. To the kids it's an opportunity. Their parents get to come to these competitions that happen on Saturdays just like sports. And when they see their parents applauding them and the pride on the parents' faces, don't lose sight of the impact that makes on an eight, nine, 10, 11 year old child that's what to them tells them, hey, this is something worth doing when I get to middle school, when I get to high school. That now they're not afraid of science classes, classes and computer classes and technology classes. They're actually taught those are cool, those are important, and it makes a difference. So anything that can be done to help elementary schools get kids involved in science programs that parents can actually support and come and witness, I would say is, is going to make a huge difference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Tonko. I'm going to do a little, uh, something a little bit different here. And I mentioned it to some of you before the hearing began. Uh, and I don't want you to feel obligated to take advantage of uh, this opportunity. But if you feel uh, that it would be beneficial uh, for the record and insightful as we um, deliberate uh, public policy issues related to your comments, then feel free. If there are any comments by congressmen or questions that might have been directed to one of your other colleagues that you uh, felt you had some insight that you would like to share, but because it wasn't directed at you, uh, you were not able to, or any uh, comments made by your fellow witnesses that you would like to add to at this point, uh, please feel free uh, to add that insight at this time. Dr. Beath, do you have anything else? And, and again, I understand it's a broad question. Normally, if I focused it, people would immediately jump on it. Uh, but this is a broad question, and don't feel obligated. But if you have anything you'd like to add, uh, please do so at this time. Well, just, just briefly, um, I, I, what I see amongst uh, a lot of the discussion here today is the, the need to get STEM professionals more involved at all different types of levels, whether it's in uh, uh, being mentors in classroom, being credentialed, <coughs> providing robotics competitions, and so on. And um, I mean, it uh, it makes me think that something in the preparation of those STEM individuals or in their professional training needs to help them um, think about working in the K-12 world. Thank you, Dr. B. Ms. Sutton. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to take one minute to uh, make you aware that uh, our school is also fielding a couple of cyber patriot teams which is working in cybersecurity and one of the reasons I'm really excited about this is where uh, the robotics or some of the other hands-on projects you can see what's happening because it's very physical sometimes when you work in information technology there's not a lot to look at you know it's it's just sitting there but with the cyber patriot competition they have goals they have challenges they have they're competing against other schools and they're being monitored and scored and we have an SAIC mentor that's working with my cyber security class and and we do actually have I think it's 12 students that are actively part of these teams and are preparing and to me it's a real matter of, of national security that these kids get excited and, and a lot of these kids didn't even know that there were jobs where they could you know basically get paid to hack you know they could be penetration testers they could evaluate systems and when they get to see that they could have this much fun and get paid for it they're very excited about it so I teach up a class when they're all juniors and seniors and I have a couple that now are looking for ways to to 
to <coughs> further their education so that they can do this for a living, and, and that makes me feel like we're, we're accomplishing something. I sure hope they're being uh, taught to hack the right thing. Ethically, <laughs> ethically, yes, yes, ethically. Just as an aside, uh, I think it was Mr. Morella who, who commented on this. At Grissom High School in Huntsville, uh, we have a lot of academic teams. It might be math, it might be science, it might be debate, it, any number of things. And believe it or not, we actually have applause from the mm -hmm. parents at some of the uh, contests mm -hmm. oh, that, yeah. that are involved with that. Yeah, and we actually have tryouts, and not everybody makes it. I mean, it's, st it's high status to make some of our teams. It's a remarkable school. Uh, Ms. Wellner, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, just two quick points. And first of all, at IBM, we do have an ethical hacking unit, so send them, <laughs> send them over. <laughs> um, I, just, I wanted to add just two last things. One is to say that this is a partnership. You know, um, professionals from private industry bring an enormous amount, but they do need the training. They need the continued training and classroom practices. We need the schools of education to get involved. We need uh, their training as they're becoming STEM professionals to get involved. We need the school's involvement, the, the state and the federal departments of education. So this really is a partnership. It's nothing that private sector can't fix this, but we can certainly bring something very important to the table. And we have to do it with a sense of humility, working with all of, all of these partners. And the last thing I would just share with you is something that the principal where our first transition to teaching um, graduate uh, landed. And she said to me afterwards, you know, what's so wonderful about having Jennifer at this school is that the minute she walks into the classroom and she tells these young people that she was an executive at IBM, they don't know what that really means, but they've heard of IBM. And they know she had this great job, and now she chose <coughs> them. And that that changes their lives from there going forward. And we just want to keep doing more of that. Thank you, Ms. Wilner. Uh, Mr. Morell, anything to add? Yeah, um, I had mentioned earlier that there's that whole spectrum, and I guess um, what I want to also talk about is it's great if these industry professionals can go into teaching full time. If they retire and they want to do that, that's we need more STEM related um, qualified teachers. But I think it's really important to also recognize that that huge potential of the bridge of the people who don't need to go into teaching full time but can volunteer and can do it part time. Could be two hours a week, could be two hours a month. And, and here's why I think that's really important. There's a really big difference between being a mentor and a teacher. And when you're a teacher, just like anybody who has kids knows, once you get to middle school and high school, they start to tone you out just like they tone their parents out, right? Um, they think you have to be there. You're part of the system. When a mentor comes in, not being a teacher actually helps them get listened to. And I, I mean that, it's important. Once that mentor takes on the title of a teacher, it's not as powerful to the students. Because when you're a mentor, you come into the classroom and they don't think you have to be there. And they look at your career and your profession and your title, and to them, that shows them, hey, that's a real position, that's a real avenue that you can pursue. So it's a really powerful tool and it helps the teachers. So when mentors come into the classroom and work with a teacher, it actually reinforces what the teacher has been telling the students. It's actually a tool for the teacher to be able to say, hey, look, I'm not just telling you this. It actually does get applied in real life. There are careers. There are people who do this stuff. So it, it's really powerful. And you know, I think back to mentors and really impressive people I've met over the years. And observing students interacting with a Woody Flowers from MIT, who really is the father of educational competitive robotics as it exists today. Uh, Dave Lavery from NASA, the, the three engineers that we met at NASA Ames, um, Mark Leone, Steve Caramaros, Bob Holmes. The students getting to work with them was incredible because they looked at them kind of in awe as we keep talking about the sports culture. They were the sports stars, they were the rock stars and they were giving their time to come into the classroom, and the kids wanted to soak up whatever those mentors were offering like a sponge. And I think it's valuable that, that we recognize even part-time makes a huge difference because they are role models. Dr. Jones, any insight you wish to share? I just would like, I think on the behalf of Abbott, that we, we just as a company acknowledge the challenge that's faced as a nation with us regarding needing STEM education and STEM educated individuals. And so what we have committed to do as a company is to leverage off of our strength, which is science, and creating the programs that we discussed today and in my testimony and using them to support our communities so that we will 
in the next 5, 10, 20 years have more young people with strong education in science, technology, education, and math. Well, thank you, Dr. Beeth, Mrs. Sutton, uh, Ms. Wilner, uh, Mr. Morella, and Dr. Jones for the insight that you've shared with us today concerning uh, STEM. Uh, it's now up to uh, Congress to take that insight and implement sound uh, public policy. Having said that, the members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing, uh, should any be forthcoming. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments from members, and the witnesses are excused, and this hearing is adjourned.